Hey guys, it's Judah. I am so excited to announce version 2.0 for the Church Home app has arrived. It is here. It's a much more personalized experience. It's going to cater to ensuring that you're connecting with people, face-to-face -face relationships, and there is daily guided prayers. Chelsea and I are going to be your guide daily, guiding you through prayers that I think will deepen your relationship with God and help you in your overall experience here on earth. I'd like to start a little bit of a journey that we're going to take for the next several weeks, just at the outset of 2020. And um, 2020, I'm going to do a series on clearer vision. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I just, I couldn't help myself. 2020, okay? If I saw one more person tells me that 2020, things are going to get clearer. Uh, I, uh, I want to do a collection uh, of sermons and messages and, and talks on the subject of what's really important. What's really important? Um, Another way of saying that is, you know, why am I here? Why am I breathing? Um, what's the point of it all? Why am I getting so worked up about stuff? What is actually important? In a day and age where seemingly everything is said to be important, what actually is important? So turn to one person next to you and literally say, what's important to you? Just, just, uh, just what, what, what's, what's important to you? <laughs> and if they say you back to you, take them on a date. Take them on a date. Take them on a date. Who just got a date? Raise your hand. You just got a date. You're married, Justin. It doesn't count. You guys are going on a date. That's amazing. What's really important? Hey, can we thank the musicians and the band, everybody, for... I love you guys, gals. In a few minutes, the band, for those that are new to our space, welcome. Uh, we're a community. Again, we're passionate about serving one another. Uh, our band will come back. Volunteer band, by the way. Did you know that? That our band is volunteer. These incredible musicians volunteer their time to be here. I love you guys. So they'll join us in a few minutes. We'll sing some more songs that we know to be true about our God. What's actually important? So for a few weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to navigate the ancient scripture, and we're going to read stories, real stories that really happened about Jesus. And you're going to find out real quick, I'm a Jesus guy. I believe Jesus is God. I believe Jesus had no sin so he could pay for my sin and all of our sins, and he became sin so that we could become right with God, not by doing, earning, deserving, or behaving, but by simply receiving what Jesus has done in our place. You're going to find out real quick that is the chief cornerstone of our community. You're going to also find out real quick you do not have to believe that to belong here. You belong here, you are a human being, and we have far more in common than we don't. And what we need is a lot more love and a lot more belonging, so thank you for being here. There is zero pressure or expectation. The only thing we expect um, from you is to let us hug you. Stuff like that. Uh, letting yourself get hugged is a bit of an art form. It kind of is. It's like, okay, have you ever hugged someone? They're like... So just, just, just let, let yourself be hugged. Uh, you are loved, and we hope that you are seen and heard and cared for. Um, but we're going to go through several, several weeks now. We're going to look at these ancient passages, and we're going to try to decipher together as a community from these stories what's actually important in life. I think we're going to discover um, what was important in antiquity in ancient time is still important today, and it translates so much in 2020. Can you believe it's 2020? It really is shocking, to be honest. Someone told me this, I think it was Elijah, that we're now going to reference these as the 20s. It's like, bro, was that, was that in the 20s? And that's weird, because that's always been the 19s, but now we're in the 20s. And then the 30s are going to be like, was, oh, was that the 30s, bro? It was the 30s. So now whatever we wear, people are going to be like, oh, that was the 20s. Guy's got a lot of the 20s going on. Anyways, that's wild to think about. Okay, John 21. I'm going to jump in here. If you don't have a Bible, no worries. We've got it up on the screen. You can always download that Bible app if you'd like to. John chapter 21, and it says in verse 1. Everybody good? Everybody good, everybody good. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. This is how it happened. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel, Cain, and Galilee, sons of Zebedee, and two others of the disciples were together. Peter says this, I'd like to go fishing. I need some space. I want some margin. I need to relax. I'm going to go fishing. 
Many of them said, we're going to go with you. They went out and got in the boat, but that night, so they fish all night, hours and hours, they catch nothing. Just as the day was breaking, sun is literally coming up, Jesus stood on the shore. They don't know it's just Jesus yet. Semicolon, the disciples did not know it was Jesus. That's what I just said. Okay, next verse. Jesus said to them, children, which if you look at the original language, what he says is, you know, guys, hey, hey, you guys, do you have any fish? They yell back approximately 100 yards, no. He yells back, cast the net seven and a half feet over, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. Okay, now that's not like awesome fishing advice, right? I mean, that's not the smartest. This, this, this figure on the shore, which they can't make out, literally just suggested that they haven't caught anything because they've been seven and a half feet away for eight hours, right? Try the right side of the boat. So they cast it. Now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved, this is John now talking about himself in his own gospel, he says to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, he was stripped for work, he threw himself into the sea. He threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, about a football field away. Wonderful NFL reference in scripture. When they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it, and bread. And now we come to some of my favorite words Jesus has ever spoken on the face of the planet. In case you wonder what meal Jesus really values, it's breakfast. Bring some of the fish that you've just caught. Listen to these words. Well, after this verse. So Simon went aboard, hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 to be exact. Although there were so many, there was, the net was not torn. And Jesus says this, come and have breakfast. Come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask anything. You ever been in such a beautiful, amazing moment? You don't want to ruin it with words. No one says, who are you? For they knew that it was the Lord. It was Jesus. Jesus came and took the bread, gave it to them. And so with the fish, last verse, verse 14. Now, this was the third time that Jesus revealed himself to his guys, to his disciples, after he was raised from the dead. Again, we're going to do a number of sermons on the subject of what is really important? What is actually important? Again, in the day and age where seemingly everything is important, I actually think it is prudent and imperative that we decipher what is actually worth our energy, our time, our effort, our concern, our passion, our focus, and our desire. What is actually important? Will you join me in prayer as we pray for the Seattle Seahawks? (laughs) Oh God, Help us beat the Packers. God, thank you so much for the moments we share as a community. Lord, no doubt there's somebody in this room or somebody watching who feels a little bit unnerved, who feels uncomfortable. I pray that they would feel peace. I pray they'd feel comfort. I pray they'd feel loved and valued and seen and heard. We thank you for your grace. Thank you for your goodness and your love that knows no limits, your love that is endless and unconditional for every single person in the world and under the sound of my voice. And once again, protect Russell Wilson and help us beat Aaron Rodgers in Jesus' name. And everybody said, and everybody said, did you have a good Christmas? Everybody have a good Christmas. Uh, I missed you. It's good to see all of you. For those that don't know, this is my first Wednesday back since Christmas break. And Christmas is It's an awesome time of year. It's also, I've said this before, but it's also a challenging time of year because it is a reminder that my kids are getting older. We're 15, 13, and 10 now, so some of the magic is being lost. I'm not going to lie to you. And I agree, Christmas is about Jesus. It is about Jesus. But it's also about your kids overreacting to gifts you buy them, right? I live for this. I do. I'm not going to lie to you. I live for this. I do. That's why we spend too much. This is why we tell our kids when they ask what they want, we tell them, that's impossible. There's no way. That's too much. We can't get it for you. Not going to happen. And then we're going to get it. Because I want to see them when they open it. I want to see, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Right? I want that. That's the only thing I want. So Christmas morning happens. By the way, it is nice when your kids get older because they don't wake up at 4.45 in the morning for Christmas morning. 
Right, so we literally, I'm, I'm trying to think, babe, what time do we actually get up? Like 9 a.m. or something? 9 a.m., life is good. I woke up at 9 a.m., no alarm, to honor the Lord. And by about 9.30, where we finally opening gifts, we kind of, oh, 10. We made them wait, wait, wait an hour. Um, and, and so 10 a.m., we're sitting down to open gifts. That's right, we all, we ate, ate breakfast together. Then we at 9 o'clock. I'm so glad I really remember these meaningful moments with our family. <laughs> um, and so it's like 10 a.m., and Chelsea's family is there. None of my family are there because her family's more important than mine. And, uh, but anyways... Uh, we're with Chelsea's family because it's 20 years into marriage and I'm selfless. I don't want to brag. It's not about that at all. I'm just the one laying down his life in this marriage. But anyways, uh, no big deal. Um, I'm housing Chelsea's entire family for Christmas and they're eating my food. It's not about me. So we're sitting there and we're, we're opening gifts and I'm not going to lie to you, not all gifts are the same. Okay, and honestly, the 13 and 15 year old, I'm like, they're not gonna give me what I want anymore, right? I mean, my 15 year old, they open their gift like, ah, oh, wow, it's cool, dad, it's cool. Okay, true story. A friend of mine really likes this artist named Cause, and so I thought to myself, I'm gonna get him a Cause, I'm gonna give both my boys Cause dolls for Christmas, because I heard that's cool, right? This amazing artist named Cause, which I, and I love his artwork, so I'm like, this is amazing. I go online, I find a couple of dolls for like $99 a piece. I'm like, jackpot, this, I think these are supposedly more expensive than that. So they come in a very bland packaging, which I find odd because typically they come with authentic, authentic, authentication, thank you. And I was like, that's weird. And then on the box, it said made in China. On the back, it said made in China. And I'm like, that's cool. They, they work this through China. And so <laughs> it's the one gift I was happy about. So Zion, my, my 14, 15-year-old, opens it, and he's like, oh, cool, Dad. I'm like, cool, man. That's cause, bro. <laughs> right? That's cause. And he's like, yeah, cool. And I'm like, something's off. So I go over to him. I'm like, yeah, I got those online. I got a pretty good deal. He looks up, and he goes, in the most compassionate way he could, they're fake, Dad. And you know what I said to him? You're fake. It's real plastic, bro. <laughs> I go, are you going to put it in your room? He goes, probably not. <laughs> so anyway, so the, the teenagers don't give me what I want anymore. So really all I'm focused on is my little girl, Grace, right? I'm like, I'm like, she's not my favorite, but, you know. So I'm waiting for her to open the one gift we swore. And we did. We, we sold this thing hard during like Thanksgiving to Christmas. We're like, there's no chance we're going to get you this ele electronic device that you want. Now, I'm not going to tell you what kind of electronic device it is, lest you judge me and my parenting. So all I'm going to say is it was an electronic device that according to our former Smith House rules, you had to be 12 to get it. She's 10. So I kept telling her there's no chance. You're 10. The boys didn't get one until they were 12. I'm not getting it for you. There's no way. Baby, honestly, I don't want you to be disappointed on Christmas. I was doing the, I mean, full, full court press. I'm like, listen, baby, you need to let this thing go. I'm going to get you everything else on your list. I mean, Santa is. And, but this is the one we can't get you. Well, then Chelsea comes to me. She says, listen, actually, you know, I think, I think we can. And I was like, you think we can? You've been faking? I've been faking. Okay, let's do this. So we go and buy the gift. And now we're back at our house with Chelsea's entire family. And I'm paying for everything. And <laughs> that's not important, though. It's about family and love. And I got fake cause dolls, <laughs> two of them. And so I'm like, oh, man, I can't wait till she opens this gift. Now, all of a sudden, and I don't mean to sound crass. I'm just being honest with you. It's 2020, OK? Things are supposed to get clearer. It's 2020. And so, um, uh, all of a sudden, I gotta go. I gotta go number two. <laughs> it's the worst time, right? And then, and you know, like Chelsea's family, I love them and everything, but I don't wanna tell everybody, hey, can you guys stop while I go number two? Cause then you go on the clock. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like when you're out at a meal together and all of a sudden, like, I mean, number one, you can tell everybody, I gotta go pee, I'll be back, you know, like, but you can't tell everybody when you gotta go cause you don't know how long you're gonna go, right? <laughs> So I'm like, I'm like, I think I kind of navigated the routine. I'm like, oh, Grace isn't going to open for a while. I'm going to slip out. Hopefully nobody sees me. And so I go to use the facility. 
Now, I've gone about five minutes. Since this has happened, Chelsea's like, you were gone 20, okay? Welcome to marriage. And I'm like, babe, it was five minutes. She's like, it was 20. So I come back. I come back, and what I come back to is the worst possible scenario, okay? Everybody's still there eating my food. And Gracie's running around. She's already opened the gift. And I look, I look around, she's like, still, she's like, isn't it amazing? And she's showing everyone this electronic device that sometimes you can talk with to people long distance. And she's showing everyone. And I'm like, what, what happened? What, Chelsea! And she's like, what? You were gone. And I'm like, I, to the bathroom, I'm not leaving you. Like, I'm not, what, you couldn't wait? And she's like, no. In fact, she knew, babe, please stop talking on the front row. She knew I was sharing this story tonight. And she's like, you better not tell everybody. You better tell them that you slipped out of the room and you didn't tell anybody. And that's why your daughter opened the one gift you wanted to see. She apparently, I don't know, I wasn't there. She stood up, she shouted, she screamed, she danced, she cried, she wept, she laid on the floor. All the things I wanted. By the time I got back, she was exhausted. She had nothing left to offer me. She's like, thanks, Dad. I'm like, thanks, Dad? <laughs> now, this makes for a funny story, but this really happened on Christmas Day. Suddenly, I'm, I'm seated. I'm seated by the Christmas puzzle. There's not even room on my own couch because Chelsea's family's there. And <laughs> so I'm sitting in a dining chair by the puzzle. Don't even get courtside for Christmas. And I'm looking at this puzzle, and I'm like, man. And all of a sudden, on Jesus' birthday, I'm having an attitude. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. Chelsea could have asked her to wait five minutes. And Chelsea's thinking, 20. She was wrong. Okay, I knew how long it took. I was hurrying, by the way. And I was like, I can't. So I'm, this is, I'm being honest with you. I'm like, this is ridiculous. I'm so angry. You ever talk to yourself into being angry, too? You're like, honestly. They, they're, they're about to find out how angry I am. <laughs> Whole family's gonna have to, you know when you get angry, but you, and you, what you want is everyone to be like, hey Judah, are you okay? And what you wanna be like, oh, I'm fine. Oh, who, me? Oh, I'm fine. Sitting back here in the back, in the back of the room, in the back, and you, it, by the puzzle, and yeah, oh, I'm, 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 I'm fine all by myself. Nobody asked anything, everybody was happy. Chelsea comes over, she goes, what's wrong? I said, what's wrong? I said, what's, are, you, are you being real right now? What's wrong? <laughs> Are you actually asking me what's wrong? I said, baby, all I, want, all I wanted to see was Gracie open the one gift. That's all I wanted to see. She goes, well, you disappeared. We didn't know where you went. I said, babe, well, you could have asked. You could have came looking for me. The house is not that big. <laughs> like, she walked away. She goes, you better change your attitude. That's the worst thing people can say. <laughs> change my attitude. Change your life. And I know this is crazy, man, but this is Christmas Day, and I'm literally having to do self-talk. I'm like, you know, you know when you get in that weird headspace where you're like, your daughter's actually still in the room, right? She's got the electronic device. Like, you could just actually love her, or you could pout by the puzzle and be like, oh, this Christmas sucks. <laughs> I still love Jesus, of course, but do you know what I mean? And I, I literally started doing this. I was like, I was like, all right, man, you got to get this thing. You got to get it together, right? People are still opening gifts, by the way. And I'm like, oh, that's amazing. Oh, do you like it? It's fake, too. <laughs> and I literally had to tell myself, I literally had to tell myself, I said, uh, um, what's important here? What's important? Yes, you wanted to see her. And I did this whole little just mental exercise. I'm just telling you, it's, it's kind of led me into where I want to go for the next several weeks in our community. What's important? Is it important that you got the reaction you wanted to get from your daughter opening the gift? Or how about your daughter, your 10-year-old daughter who's sitting right over there who in just a few Christmases is going to move out of this house, marry some guy when she's 40? <laughs> oh, you don't have to laugh. That was serious. But she's going to be gone. She's right there. How about you? And I was like, man, that's what's important. It's not important that I... And it just got me thinking, what's actually important. How many times you and I get in a funk, we get in a funk over something that actually 
is not as important as we think it is. But you get myopic, don't you? You get myopic. You get in the moment and you're like, this is the single most important thing in the world. I came to my hair salon. I asked for the same haircut I always get. And this is what I get. I can't even be seen in public, right? And all of a sudden, a haircut turns into you being unhinged and life has lost its perspective and we, well, we forget what's important, don't we? We forget what's important. What's actually important? Now, here's the challenge. I watch television. I watch movies. I'm subject to marketing. I'm subject to social media just like you. Everything is important now. What everybody is releasing is important. What everybody's creating is important. And to an extent, yes, everybody. But in relationship to you, or do we have the capacity and the, bil- and the ability of starting a brand new decade to assess, maybe we'll have to say it out loud, what's actually important? So we're normal human beings and we're all in this together. We're all in the same room right now. Or you're watching online, you're watching this, and we're all facing real things like economics, um, occupation, uh, relationship status, identity, fulfillment, satisfaction, all these things, right? I love, we talk about money, right? People are like, money is not important, right? Which is oftentimes people who say that have some, which is convenient. You ever, ever had a rich person tell you like, man, money's not important. You're like, yeah, 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 I know, but I want to see if it is though. <laughs> Just let me try for a little bit. Yep, it doesn't, it's not important, but now I got it. So we good, you know, like, So we're fickle, aren't we? We say things aren't important, and yet we walk out of spaces like this, and they consume our emotions. We attach our emotions, our identity, our affections, our desires, our our, our limited physical, actual energy, and we connect it to these things that oftentimes, if put in the right context, we'll admit they're not really that important. And yet, you leave the job interview a mess. How'd it go? It's terrible. Mom, I, they hate me. I was terrible. I hate, I hate LA. I hate this world. I hate this life. I hate everything. I hate culture. I'm coming home, mom, right? And yet, if I got you in the right headspace, you'd be like, oh, a job isn't everything. But man, in those moments, it becomes everything. And I wonder if you look at the decade that was, and you look at the decade that is, if we could be honest with ourselves, that a lot of the complexities and the emotions and the challenges, and dare I even say, even some of the fears and worries that consume us are oftentimes connected to things that categorically are not really important. They're just not that important. It's an amazing thing. I don't want to be cliche here, but bear with me. It is an amazing thing when a loved one passes, how your brain can get in that space momentarily about in light of death, right? In light of the brevity of life. Isn't it amazing? You'll leave a funeral or you'll leave a moment. Remember when my dad passed and it's like, I'm done with this, this, this. None of that matters. Life is short. I'm gonna, but then life happens. And it's been nine years since dad's gone and it's amazing what I have made important that really isn't that important. Now, That brings us to our passage tonight, and we'll go to some other stories in the weeks ahead. In this passage, Jesus has lived on the earth for approximately 33 years. Now, 30 of those were silent. We have almost zero record. We have a glimpse of when he's an infant. We have a glimpse when he's a toddler. We have a glimpse when he's 12, and then we don't see him again until he's 30. It's the silent years. But from 30 to 33, we have much, if not most, of the writings about Jesus. Now, by the time we pick up the story in John 21, Jesus now has gone to the crucifixion. He has died. He was buried in a rich man's tomb. And just like he said three days later, he rose from the dead, which is to say, simply put, he actually predicted his death, burial, and resurrection, and he's the only one who pulled it off. He pulled it off. He told everybody he would do it. In fact, there are hundreds of prophecies that he would do it. In fact, there were 600 prophecies he fulfilled, some that were 2,000 years old, while the six hours he hung on the middle cross between two thieves. This is a mathematical impossibility. We have to face some of these facts. The third day he rises again. Why do we know this? Not because we have a book. The book came after the eyewitnesses verbally spread the news through generations. 
This was recorded years after the resurrection. The resurrection was word of mouth. Hundreds of people actually physically saw Jesus. They saw the scars in his hands, the scars in his side, the scars in the crown of his head. They saw the scars. This was, in fact, the same man who was humiliated, brutalized, beaten, and killed on the middle cross. He beat death, came back, and basically said, I told you so. And everybody's like, hey, okay. <laughs> Evidently, everything he said is true. Now, if he stays dead, everything he said is false. But everything he said is true. I'm here tonight passionately preaching about a person, not principles or concepts or ideologies, but a person because the person I'm excited about, almost missed the chair, no big deal, it's 2020. <laughs> Things are getting clear. I'm seriously, I'm coordinated, guys. Leave me alone. Um, <laughs> but in 2020, we're, 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 we're here... I'm obsessed with the only person I know who has predicted their death, burial, and resurrection and pulled it off. He's become everything to me. And the story goes, this is now many days after his resurrection. He has, to this point, John 21, he has appeared two times now to some of his closest friends. By the time we get to John chapter 21, Things are still in limbo. And what I mean by that is the disciples are still emotionally unsettled. Now, they are thrilled. They are ecstatic that Jesus, in fact, is alive. But they got a lot of questions about the implications of his return. And what I mean by that is many of these disciples we now know were believing that Jesus would establish a real, physical, tangible throne and overthrow things like Rome and take over, right? Peter was ready to be the vice president. He's like, are you guys ready? We're about to do this, man. We got a small army, but he's God, right? We're gonna take over, but that doesn't happen. Peter, I think, is unsettled, some of the other disciples, and he says this, I need to get some space. I need to get some air. Let's go fishing. Let's go fishing. Now, let's establish context just for a moment. Why are they going fishing? First of all, there's a few guys in, in this crew. Fishing was their occupation. Okay, we know this about Peter. We believe Peter was a professional fisherman at a very young age. Many scholars believe Peter lived around water. Peter was very well versed in water. Peter's getaway is fishing. That's his hobby. It's also something he's very, very good at. So Peter's like, I'm gonna go back. I need to clear my head. There's a lot going on. Jesus is back. What does it all mean? Let's go fishing. Now, what would be going through the thoughts and brains of these men? I'll tell you some of the things. What does this mean about my job? What do I, keep in mind, all 12 of these dudes, there's only 11 left, okay? They, they left their jobs. They have been jobless with Jesus for three years, okay? The three days Jesus was dead, they're like, they took it so far to say they're gonna kill us too. They locked themselves in a room. Jesus walks through that room a few verses before this. And they're like, ah. So now they're out of the room where they were scared to death, but they still got a lot of questions about Jesus, about what he's gonna do, what he's about, what the plan is, right? Because we thought these three years we were building a political campaign to take over the highest office in the land so we could rule. This is gonna be amazing. He died, he's back, but he's not doing what we thought he would be doing. When are we going to Rome? When are we going to take over? Peter's like, I got a lot on my mind. Let's go fishing. The guy's like, we'll go with you. And they're there thinking about real stuff, practical stuff. What am I going to do for work? What does my future look like? What am I going to do relationally? How is this going to look? What about my identity? What about my self-worth? What is this all for? What is this all about? I kind of look silly. I kind of look... If this doesn't actually work out the way that I told my friends that it would work out and Jesus actually doesn't like overthrow Rome and we don't like, you know, you know become like the world power, I wonder if people will, will think I'm silly and, and, and dumb for, for, for doing this. And so they go fishing and Jesus shows. Jesus shows. Jesus shows. They're out fishing all night. They catch nothing. The guy on the shore goes, you got anything? You catch anything tonight? They don't recognize his voice. I don't know why. No. He says, um, gives them the worst possible fishing advice in history. Move your net seven and a half feet. That'll be key. I think they started to go, wait a minute, because it says they took their net. These are pro, some pro fishermen in the boat, and they're like, okay. They throw it in, 
and almost instantaneously, you got 153 big fish. John looks at the catch. He probably remembers Luke 5, which we'll talk about in a moment, and he says to Peter, it's him. It's him. Now, they didn't expect Jesus to show up back in kind of their old stomping grounds. John goes, it's him. Peter gets so excited, he jumps in the water and he swims a football field. By the way, that's a long swim, if you ask me. 100 yards, it's a lot more than I did in 10 years. Anyways, he swims to shore, and yet it becomes this quiet scene because no one wants to ruin this holy moment. And they just kind of sit there and Jesus just goes, oh, bring some of the fish. He already has fish, already cooking them breakfast. It's the only scene we have where Jesus is the chef. It's unbelievable. He's a chef. He can cook. He can do anything. He's God. <laughs> and he says, sit down. And some things happen here. Some things happen here that just find, this find, it's very interesting. In helping us to decipher what's actually important in life. Now, when you hear 153 fish, you probably go, what would I do with that? But if I told you, you were going to get $153,000, you'd be like, word, yeah. Perfect, you know, 153 fish was a career-making catch for anyone who caught fish. I'll prove it to you. It was so many fish, the narrative tells us they were shocked it wasn't breaking. In other words, these boats and nets were never built for this big of a catch. This is a career-making moment. This is how stories get told and you become an absolute legend in the fishing community. I call it fishing community because I don't know what anyone else, I don't know what else we would call it, okay? But in the fishing community, they're always gonna talk about this cat. This is where you go down to the dock, to the wharf, and you're like, hey! And buyers show up and go, what? And you sell them at a premium. This is good fish, 153 fish. This is a big moment, money-wise, Career-wise, reputation-wise, I'm talking about like lore, legend. This is when people talk about you for decades. Well, you ever hear about that one catch? What one catch? Talking about catch 153? You ever hear about catch 153? We talking about 153. Nobody's ever had 153 fish in a net. Oh yeah, they did. Guy's name was Simon Peter. Him and his crew, no way. Didn't catch anything all night. Some stranger said, try it on the other side. They did it, they caught 153 fish. No way, yeah. I wasn't there, my grandpa was there, crazy. <laughs> but I wanna ask you a question about this passage. Where does the catch go? Where does the catch go? I'm reading through this and I'm like, it says they, it's 153. In fact, in fact, it says, when they got out in the land, verse 9, they saw a charcoal fire in place, laid it on the bread. Jesus said to bring some of the fish. So Simon Peter went aboard. Hold on, hold on. The career-making catch, they haven't even brought it to shore. They left it in the boat, got off the boat, and sat in probably a little circle around Jesus. And he's like, go get the fish. And Peter's like, oh, right, 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 right. And he's, and he goes, am I the only one that's starting to pick up that this career-changing catch is a little bit of an afterthought? Now, I know in your context and my context, we're like 153 fish. They left all that for Jesus. Big deal. So again, let's translate it into our culture. What is it that you're fishing for? What are you fishing? Are we all fishing for something? Some of you, when I said turn to your neighbor and said, and say it's a new decade and say hello or what's really important, and you were hoping they would say that you're important and you were fishing for them. <laughs> Saw a couple of you get up from your chair and, hey, what's important to you? you know, like, <laughs> all right, you know. Hey, we're all out here fishing. Let's be honest. We're all out here fishing. All of us. Hoping for the big catch, hoping for the big catch. Hey, it's 2020, what do you think? Ah, not hoping for much. Really? That's not the combo we have very often. 
Not in this town. 2020, it's my decade. It's my decade, bro. It's my decade. Yeah, I'm doing it. Going big. 2020, it's the 20s, right? What are you hoping for? Big catch, big fish. Ugh, you were doing this, right? And everybody's out for the big catch. These guys are just guys. These guys are just dudes. What, what are they doing? In fact, it occurs to me, Jesus already had on the shore what they were fishing for, and that rhymed totally unexpectedly. <laughs> Doesn't he? I love this part of the story. He goes, go get that fish you caught. Everyone's like, oh, you already got some. He's like, yeah, go get some of the new ones. <laughs> okay. We have no record of Jesus cooking them. He's like, just go get them. Put a couple of them around the fire. And I'm like, are you, are you sending these guys a message? And now they're dead in heaven. Are you sending us a message? What's the message? Here's something to consider. I wonder if what you're fishing for, Jesus already has on your shore. Like, are we going to spend 10 more years? Like, I don't even know what kind of fishing this is. It's like, shoot it, don't, bro. Stay in your lane. What is my lane? You know, <laughs> can't even sit on a chair. But <laughs> come on, am I the only one? That, this is it. This is it. Somebody hold me. This is it. Oh, it's a boot. <laughs> Thought it was one of the big ones. And we don't catch what we're looking for. And so what do we do? Are you like me? I'm gonna go talk to God about what I'm not catching. Hey, God, I, 2020's got to be my decade. I need you to help me with the big catch. Now I've outlined very specifically what, how I define big catch. And I have trusted you to help me find what I'm fishing for. And up until this point, I still haven't found what I'm fishing for. Okay, but I, I still, I need you to, and here's what typically happens, this, at least in my life. You're like, are we, are we good? Okay. My man, here it is! And what we, none of us want to talk about is that oftentimes when we get the catch we ask God for, we're like, How are you? I got it. Woo! Thank you. Talk to you soon. <laughs> Not too soon. Because I got what I was fishing for. Be careful what you wish for now. You might get it. Be careful what you fish for. You might get it. What does it profit a man to fish his whole life? And in the process, reel in everything life has to offer. But in the process, loses so. Got a boat full of all of your caught dreams. Check it out. What do you think? And then we all die. Uh, well, shoot, I'm 22. I'm not about to die. You're not. But you will someday. And we, isn't it funny? I'm, I'm. I can't even enjoy Christmas. Not because my kids aren't there, they're right there. Because what I think is important is that the money I spent on that electronic device, I want a response out of her that I want. And now I didn't get it and my wife was not sensitive to the fact that I'm supplying all this for her family and she did not stop her, so I'm mad. Really? Really, is that what's important? Jesus might already have on the shore what you're fishing for, but it might not be the way you think. What are those guys doing out in that boat anyways? I don't know. They didn't catch nothing. Isn't it, it, it amazing the headspace they must have been in? Jesus 
back from the dead. That was cool to see him, right? Yeah, that was cool. That was cool. You thinking what I'm thinking? Nah, nah I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's all good. It's going to work out. You think like, you, you going to be vice president? Where are you going to be? I don't, I don't know. You, what you think? Um, sounds like I hadn't seen him lately. You, yeah. Sure wish we could catch something. I wonder if Peter's wrestling with, am I just going to go back to living the life I was? You ever known enough about God to make life without him terrible? You ever just known enough about God to be like God's gracious, loving, caring, forgiving? I don't really acknowledge him or think about him or spend time with him. Therefore, I'm not. You ever, you, you ever wanted to be somewhere, but also somewhere else at the same time, and you're not good at any place? I think that's the side. They're in the boat talking about us. It's really cool fishing, I guess. I haven't seen Jesus in a few days. Some of you know so much about God, you know too much because it makes living the average life, whatever that is, almost unbearable. I think there's more, you know? Some of you got that sinking sensation. I think there's more to all this. I think there's more than church. I think there's more than sermons and podcasts. I think there's more than just singing a couple songs. I think I'm supposed to know God. So, so here's the question, and I promise I'm coming to a close. What is your number? Because we all got one. You ever played that game? What would you do for a billion dollars? My favorite is when someone's like, nah, I wouldn't do it for less than 100 million. What about 99? All right, all right, you got me, you got me. What about 90? You got me there too. What about 10 million? I'm in, you know, like, you know what I mean? Like, so let's be realistic, but what is your number? What's your number? Let's just play the numbers game. Is your number $1,500? Is that what you need from God to pay rent? God, if you gave me $1,500, I would know that you're God. <laughs> now, God, I need $15,000, $15,300. Now, Lord, what I really need is $153,000. If I had a hundred, ooh, if I had a hundred and fifty-three thousand down payment, get a house, I'd be good. I'll serve you forever. Now, Lord, what I need, I know this, I need $1.5 million. $1.5, I'm good. I'm good. Now, Lord, some of you are like, I'm good now, Judah. No, Lord, I need $15.3 million. That's my number, and some of you are really believing for a lot. I need $153 million, Lord. We laugh, but come on. What's your number? Because I, I, I've, I've tried to find the reasons. Why do we have the number 153 in here? I've added it up. Five plus one is six, plus three, seven, eight, nine. Nine's not even that important of a number in, in, in Scripture. I'm like, so it can't be nine. What's the number? What's the point? What's the message? I wonder if the point is there's just a number there. Because 153 fish was a career-changing catch. It was like, bro, you're set for life as a fisherman with that kind of catch. And what I mean by that is there's always going to be a job for somebody who's that good at fishing. That was it. Your resume would read something like this. I once caught 153 fish. And they would go, you got the job. In one catch, one catch, sir. I got some of my buddies here. They'll verify. They were there. Wow. And yet, it becomes irrelevant. Jesus already has it on the shore. And it's like, I'm reading this and I'm going, you guys don't even, that's enough money to, now, I'll say this. Jesus is not, he's not, he's not mad at you, your desire for 153 fish. He's not. He gave them it, didn't he? Jesus is not mad at money. Money is neither good nor bad. It's what you do with it. That's all. This isn't about money. It's not, the point is just what we think it's important, what we prioritize, what we work for, what we stress over, what we worry about, what keeps us up at night. It's usually a number. It is. And we're like, man, if I could just be careful now because you might get it. I'm telling you. I tell pastors the same thing. You want to build a church, be careful, you might get it. And then you're going to have to sustain it. You have to live in it under scrutiny and everything else. You better be careful now. You ask for it. And, and sometimes we come to God and we're like, I just need you to, and then we get it. And we're like, I'll talk to you in heaven. 
But in this passage, what seems to be most important? Let's call it what it is. Breakfast with Jesus is number one. No striving. Nobody's saying a big ornate prayer. All they hear is these, I, I think they're soft. I think Jesus says, come eat, come eat breakfast. And they're all like, wow, it's him. It's him. And they just sit there in silence. And they're like, this is amazing. As if to say, being with Jesus is the most important thing. We have no record what happened to the big career break. Why don't they tell us? We're told the number, and we're told that Peter got a few of them and put them there, but Jesus, we don't even have record that Jesus cooked them because he already has it, and they fall in love with Jesus. And I end with this. I'm done. I'm concluding. I'm looking at this story, and obviously I'm drawn to Luke chapter 5. Those of you that are familiar, Luke chapter 5 is a fishing moment. John 21 is a fishing moment. Now, Luke 5 is a fishing moment at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. John chapter 1, John chapter 21 is a fishing moment at the end of Jesus' ministry. So he starts his ministry with a fishing miracle, and he ends his ministry or the beginning of the church with a fishing miracle. But I want to draw your attention to one of the more outspoken characters in our story, and his name is Peter. He goes by Peter. His old name was Simon. He's oftentimes called Simon or Peter in the Bible narrative. In Luke chapter 5, they get this catch. Now, I don't have time to get into this, but the catch they get in Luke chapter 5, it breaks their nets and starts sinking their boats. Now, we could talk why that is, because I think it's a picture of life without depending on Jesus. It'll overwhelm you. They catch all this fish, and I want you to hear the words of Peter. Luke chapter 5 and verse 8. Listen to Peter's response now. This is the first fishing miracle. Peter is just becoming familiar with Jesus. And Peter says this, and I quote verse 8. He fell on his knees before Jesus. Listen to what Peter says. And he says, you got to get away from me. I can't. You can't. You can't give me my big break. You can't make my career. You don't understand. I can't, I can't live up to this. I'm not a good man. I'm a bad person. You need to go help and bless somebody else. I need distance from you. I cannot deserve, earn, or warrant this. Do you know why Peter says this? Because this is the exact way all of humanity had related to God for thousands of years. If you are good enough, if you are spiritual enough, if you are noble and moral and kind and loving, God will bless you. Peter sees the catch and he says to Jesus, I'm not who you think I am. You can't give me this. Therefore, you got to go. Please, please spare. You got to go. I need space. I need, you got to, I need, where's Peter's focus? Where's Peter's focus? Where's his focus? You could say it's Jesus. It's not. It, in fact, the Bible says in Luke chapter five, all the guys were astonished at the catch. I'm telling you, this is where humanity is most of the time. God gives us a miracle and we're like, thanks God. Wow. Look at this. Oh my word. God did this for you? Yeah, it's a new Escalade. He just gave it to me. Whoa! Whoa! Wow, it's amazing, I know, right? Well, how'd you get an Escalade? Well, I've been given faithfully in church. God blesses those who give in church. So I got an Escalade because I'm a giver. <laughs> Can you teach me how to get an Escalade? Yeah, yep. Escalade, it's Escalade uh, one-on-one. You got to give a certain amount of faithful amounts of money to your church and then God will bless you. Oh, wow. Okay. And, and no offense. The focus isn't Jesus. It's the dream. It's the career. A career that you will age out of. I love you, but I'm going to tell you the truth. Somebody's going to come along younger, prettier, more talented, and they're going to be like, we, we gonna, it's time for you to phase out. We've loved having you here at this business, but it, 
your age, we just, well, we, we turned the page. <laughs> What'd you say? Yeah, it's, now, we, we want to bless you, give you a beautiful Rolex watch as we phase you out into retirement. <laughs> I don't, wait, what? God gave me this job. I'm sure he did, sir. That's good to hear. <laughs> I, this is God's miracle for me. I'm, well, I think that's wonderful. We're going to let, let you go now. You can't let me go. Yeah, that's actually what I can. It's CEO outside the door. I'm going to go and let you go. You, but no, God. You hear where I'm going now? Peter, Peter says, you, you can't. This isn't. Wait a minute. The same guy. Fast forward approximately three years. Do you see his response? John goes, the guy on the shore, it's Jesus. And Peter doesn't yell. Get away from us. You're too good. We're bad. By the way, by the time John 21 comes around, he's denied Jesus three times. And what does he do when Jesus shows up with a career changing? He dives in the water. And I just, I, I just imagine what he's thinking about when he's just, I don't even know what stroke he's using, you know, but he's just like, <laughs> and he gets there and he's probably breathless. <sighs> And there's no words. He just <sighs> looks down at the fish, looks at Jesus soaking wet. He's just like, <sighs> and Jesus probably motions to sit down. Peter sits down, <sighs> just keeps staring at Jesus. He just wants to be close to him. <sighs> oh, I don't swim that much. I'm out of breath. Is this the same guy three years ago? He's like, I don't deserve, I can't, I can't. I'm not qualified. Peter now knows after three years with Jesus, it's not about that. It's not about any of that. What's important? Oh, my brothers and sisters, you find me anywhere, I'll be the first person to pray with you that you get that job. Are you kidding me? I'll be the first person in line at your book signing. I'm down, get that book deal, do it. I pray for it. It's, as long as you know, that book's going to collect dust someday. You, that's not what's most important. Isn't it about, isn't it, isn't it crazy? And I'm done, I'm done. I'm in three years with Jesus. Just three years with Jesus. What it does to a man. He doesn't have time to focus on a career changing break. John says, it's him. Peter says, what? He came out to where I used to work? He came out here on a low moment? He knows what I did? I just want to be close to him. He didn't have to say nothing. So many of us are all worked up. We're about to start 40 days of prayer. And the reason I hate saying that is everybody's like, 40 days? I don't know how to do four minutes of prayer. How am I going to do 40 days of prayer? Most churches do prayer and fasting. We're going to do prayer and feasting. <laughs> We're going to eat breakfast with Jesus. <laughs> I just, just, just bear with me. I'm done. I'm done. Today I was just closing my eyes and I'm, actually I was closing my eyes while Megan was putting all this makeup on my face. And um, she said I needed a lot of bronzer. But I was closing my eyes and I was just trying to watch Peter swim. I know that sounds odd to you, but I closed my eyes. I, I want to see, I just want to see him in, in the surf, just swimming. And I'm just trying to watch him swim with all this like, and this emotion that's consumed him is he's trying to get closer to Jesus. And, I, and I, I felt this again. I was like, I don't know if I'm familiar with the Jesus that Peter is swimming towards. Because I still feel like this Peter, who's so focused on what you earn, what you deserve, what you warrant, what you get when the getting's good and your catch and your career and your stuff and your things. And I'm astonished by all of that. And then I relate to Jesus as it relates to the catch he gives me or doesn't give me. And I keep thinking that my relationship with Jesus has so much to do with him giving me what I think I want. 
But then three years into time with Jesus and this guy, Peter, he doesn't even care. Peter, and he just, I love this part because nobody has anything good to say. They're just mesmerized. And I think what's overwhelming to them is where Jesus came. He came to them in a really average, normal moment. And so I want that to happen to you and I want it to happen to me. I want this way of relating to God because now the new way of relating to God is what God blesses you and gives you, it all flows from you, from him. And it's because of him. It's because of what he's done and what he's accomplished and who he is. And you don't earn it and you don't deserve it and you don't warn it. It's not about your performance. It's not about what you've done, good or bad or ugly. It's just about him. And he is so good. And all he does is good. And all he does is forgive and love and care. And he's always there. He's never going to leave you nor forsake you. Doesn't matter where you are in the world, he's available to you. And he goes as far to say, I'd also made some nourishment. I made some breakfast. You have to be hungry. You've been fishing all night. I want to take care of you. I got everything you need. But you're still out there in the wild blue sea fishing for something that when you get it, it might not fill the gaping hole in your heart. What if you just spent time with me and I don't, I can't prove this. I just know it's like compound interest. You don't have to spend 40 hours with Jesus, but let's just do four minutes and then another two minutes and then another five minutes. And let's just let Jesus love us. And these 40 days of prayer, they don't have to be you talking the whole time because these guys aren't even talking, but they're with him. And they just can't believe his grace and his love and his goodness and his mercy. And who are you? Nobody's like you. When are you going to tell me, God, that I let you down? I'm not. I love you. Okay. And the story ends with no words spoken other than Jesus says, go get a few of your fish. He's like, I want to include what I helped you get. I don't need it. I just want it. Peter grabs a few fish, doesn't say anything, puts them down. And the Bible says, and this is the third time Jesus revealed himself to his disciples. And the scene closes. And the last picture we get is these guys like this. And everybody, maybe I'm reading too much into the text. You can text your favorite scholar and theologian and email me. But I, there's no striving. It's like all the worry and the fear has been sucked out of the space. And these grown men are just sitting with their Savior. And he's just feeding them breakfast. And I'm like, God, I've made this way more than it is. Way more than it is. I don't want to be at the end of my life, man. I spent my, all my whole life in a boat fishing for something he had all along grinding. My identity turns into what I can do and what I can accomplish. When in reality, we got we, we this green room back here and there's all these pictures of all these amazing people who accomplished amazing things in this town and they are all gone. And I'm like, oh God, what's important? He's important. Love's important. Sometimes having a meal with no words is important. We just say that. Sometimes just being with each other is important. Nobody has to stress and strive and try to figure out to say the right thing and make sure I'm making the connection and I'm networking. I'm just, I just, I go to a new decade and I'm like, I just want to have some more of these moments where you're so mesmerized with this person, unlike anyone you've ever met, that everything else pales in comparison in light of who he is. That's what I crave in the 20s. And I pray that you'll crave in the 20s. That's what's most important. All of this, I'll end with this. I'm done. Look, I'm closing my Bible. That's the universal sign of every preacher who's done. That's it. That's it. I closed it. It's over. It's done. Um, Jesus says, seek first me and all these things. I'll add them to you. I'll take care of them. I, 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 
I don't got any more energy, man, for focusing on things Jesus is going to add. I'm living my life for things, he said. I'll just bring that along. Lord, I need Judah. Just sit down. Be with me. And so for 40 days, we're going we're gonna, to, Chelsea and I are going to have a guided prayer, right? Available to you on the app for 40 days. Oh God, this isn't about, some of you are like type A. You're like, I'm going to do every 40 days, every day. And that's awesome. And I wish you were, you're definitely more like my wife. And that's awesome. I'm like, there's no chance I'm going I'm to make it every day. But I'm going to do some of the prayers, so that counts. But it's just about having more moments that start to add up where you're just like, man, he's wonderful. I just, instead of these 40 days of prayer being things you need to ask God for or tell, what if you just let him love you? For four, what if for 40 days... You turned everything off, used a guided prayer for a few minutes, and then just let him love you. Well, Judah, I don't know how to do that. Let it happen. See what happens. There's no rules. Jesus is available to you. He'll help you. It's going to be amazing. So I'm the crazy preacher who thinks that at the outset of a new decade, we can experience some breakfast moments with Jesus. <laughs> and I think it can change us, man. I don't know. I just, I want to end this year with people going, you've changed. Yeah. I have. What I thought was important. It has its place, but nothing compares to love relationship in Jesus. God, I thank you for these stories. We just love you so much. Just love you so much. Um, like every person in this room, God, represents like such an amazing journey and it's such an incredible story. We got all these wants and we got all these desires and we got all these dreams. I just want to say thank you for loving us and loving our dreams and desires. But we do need help remembering what's most important. We do. So captivate us, capture us. Show us who you are. Meet us on the shore. Call us in from our striving and our stressing and our worrying. Capture our attention and our heart. Help us be with you. So God, I'm, I'm, I'm actually praying for these 40 days. I just think in a few days, in a few moments, you can do anything. I imagine what you could do in 40 days of our life just allowing you to love us and be with you. So I pray that you'd help us to do that, make time, enjoy your company and your presence. Pray for that in Jesus' name. Just with head bows and eyes closed, and we're going to sing in a few moments. If you're here and you say, Judah, I, uh, I'd like to be receive the forgiveness of Jesus that only he offers. The Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin, so... Uh, we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus became sin so that you can be forgiven. Sin is error, wrong, mean, rude things we do, all of us do. Jesus has come to forgive you completely, past, present, and future sins, forgiven completely by what Jesus has done. And you'll have relationship with him and spend heaven with him forever. If you'd like to receive this free gift, and that's all it is, it's a gift. You can't earn it or deserve it. On the count of three, all over this theater, I'm going to ask you to lift up your hand and put it right back down. You know who you are. God loves you so much. The reason I ask you to raise your hand, I believe when you respond on the outside to what's happening on the inside, it just makes it more real to you. You know who you are. The count of three. One, two, three. If that's you, would you shoot your hand up all over the room? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Jesus, you see these hands. Thank you that your forgiveness flows freely and whom you forgive, you forgive all the way and completely. And one moment of faith, it's done. Thank you, God. Secondly, if you're here starting a new decade, you say, Judah, I've spent so much energy and effort and time on things that are not as important as him. And I want to start a new decade, fresh and new, with a new set of priorities. If that's you, would you join me in raising your hand? I'm raising my hand. That's what I want in the 20s. 
God, life's going to happen to all of us, and we're going to get really busy and focused on other things. We're asking that you would remind us by your kind, loving presence. Draw us, woo us, give us desires to be with you and to know you. And we thank you for that. And we dedicate these few minutes of using music as a platform to connect with you. And we ask that you'd meet us in a special way. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. If you're willing and able, would you stand with the band? And come on, let's sing out our worship. Whoa, hey, buddy. You guys see, it's the subscribe button. If you press on it, you subscribe to our YouTube channel. And you get to watch it, and we get to have fun, and we get to be friends! I love you. Subscribe.